If you're an active pilot, sooner or later, your business or personal flying will bring you over mountainous terrain. And that'll require new pilot techniques and skills. There isn't anything special or unusual or mysterious about these. For the most part, it's just plain common sense and knowing how to handle your airplane at slow speeds and how to plan your flight so as to stay out of tight spots. And once learned, these skills provide a pilot with one of the greatest experiences flying has to offer. My name is Rocky Warren, and I've been flying this mountain country for 28 years. And one thing I've learned is a lot of respect for the mountains. In Colorado alone, there are 1,500 peaks, more than 10,000 feet high, and there are over 50 that reach 14,000 feet. And if nothing else, terrain like this can take an awful lot of learning and teach a man patience. Probably one of the most important things for the beginning or any experienced pilot to do before entering the mountain area is to stop at the front range and get a check ride or a flight with an experienced pilot or flight instructor before entering. How's it going? Oh, okay. How are you doing? Come on, Where are you heading? Yeah, right. Uh, okay. uh, while we're headed west. Uh, you ever been over the mountains before? No, I haven't. This is my first time. Oh, well, yeah? Well, you might do yourself a favor by uh, getting the mountain check out from one of the instructors around here. Have the bells in here? Yes, sir. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. It sure is. Okay. Everybody out? Okay. Let's go on up to the terminal. We're going to get over here and get a check out. Check up? Yeah, that's a really good deal. Hello, Jerry McGuire, 8086 Quebec. Now uh, we're planning a trip from uh, Arapaho, Granby, Kremlin, Glenwood, Aspen, and then back to Denver, and back to Denver, please. And I'd like to have the uh, winds aloft at the mountaintops. Yeah. Okay, Jerry, let's get your fire out and let's draw a line from it. Arapahoe County, almost direct. I've been giving mountain flying courses for years, and I'm always delighted when someone stops and asks me for a little advice. A lot of times I think people are afraid to ask, but once they get through the barrier of asking, everything is just fine. The pilot and the experienced mountain pilot sit down and they can lay out the maps and really talk about it. You're going to have to have at least 14,000 to get over the pass. This is, uh, will give us a cushion. Mm -hmm. Okay, we want to plan. The foothills start right about at the west side of Denver here. We when planning a mountain flight, it's very important to use sectional charts. The best thing you can use okay. is your dead reckoning and pilotage and knowing exactly where you are all the time. And I think that this is really important because in the mountains, you can get a mile off course and everything will look completely different and you can get completely lost. You can't always depend on navigational aids because a lot of times there's going to be mountain peaks between you and the navigational aid that run into the line of sight navigation. Flying in the mountains isn't tough. It's just like any other type of flying. You need experience in doing it. When I take pilots on a mountain flying course, the first leg that I usually plan is from Denver over Corona Pass to Granby. Corona Pass is one of the highest passes in Colorado, but it is also the best pass to go over where a pilot is only at 12 to 15,000 feet for a short time. If you plan a prolonged operation over 10,000 feet, it's really highly recommended that you use oxygen. The best way to minimize turbulence in the mountains is to get out and get an early start. Fly when it's either early in the morning before the cumulus start to build on the mountain tops, or late in the evening when the temperature has started to go down. There's always weather in the mountains, and the principal weather hazards of flatland flying are the same as those in the mountains, including fogs and fronts and thunderstorms and squall lines and such. But probably the biggest difference is in the winds aloft and the wind traveling through the mountains at high speed. As the airflow passes over this rugged terrain, a lot of things happen. This can probably best be demonstrated by picturing a mountain stream or a river. The water swirls and flows and causes unpredictable currents. 
Wind in the mountains can swirl and gust only much bigger and much higher. And the currents can go all directions, causing unpredictable crosswinds and downdrafts and updrafts where least expected. talking about here is what's good weather and what's bad. Number one, visibility in the mountains is different than other places. Less than 30 miles visibility is poor visibility in the mountain country. And the big weather problem in mountains is wind and turbulence. The rule that I think is good and go by is if reporting stations are reporting winds aloft in excess of 30 knots, at mountaintop level, 12 to 14,000 feet, then just simply don't go. Because that means winds over the mountains nearly double that, or 60 to 70 knots. And that'll create a turbulence condition and a flying condition that makes mountain flying extremely difficult. It is quite common in the wintertime especially to have 100 knot winds or better Yes, sir. at 12,000 feet. In the mountains we have the Venturi effect due to the fact that there's two large peaks on either side of a valley, so to speak, and as the wind comes in, it is restricted as it goes between the peaks, and when it goes between the peaks, the velocity increases. In some cases, the airplane is completely uncontrollable, and you cannot get across the mountain. The important thing is to stay away from abrupt changes of terrain, cliffs, rugged peaks, edges, if you have to go over rugged peaks, have the altitude before you start across. However, we do have some wind up here. We're picking up light to moderate chop, 14,500 between... The pirates, of course, are uh, reports given by pilots while they're en route, generally over the radio. They are the most current weather report you can get because they are near at that time. So pirates are very important. Uh, however, the time I may be over the Continental Divide, it could be one thing. By the time the man leaves Denver and gets the Continental Divide, it could be completely obscured in IFR. I have seen times when I've departed Denver it was clear, the divide was clear, there were a few high scattered clouds and so on and so forth, but there would be snow showers laying south, and by the time you get the divide, the divide would be completely obscured in IFR. And I've seen that happen in a matter of seven minutes. It becomes very evident to any pilot flying in the mountains, crossing high mountain terrain, that if there's going to be difficulty, it warns him way in advance. And if he continues, it's going to continue to get worse. If you're going to fly across a ridge, before you get to the area of the ridge, you're going to know that you're having updrafts and downdrafts and difficulty maintaining altitude and difficulty maintaining control of your airplane. If you're having so much difficulty before you get there, you'd better quit before you get there. If you're having no difficulty flying a normal flight path, you will have no difficulty crossing the ridge. It wouldn't be wise to try to fly across a ridge that you couldn't see the other side of. If you're flying across a ridge you can't see the other side of, you're not high enough to cross it. fly up the middle of a canyon. Well, of course not, you know. Don't drive the wrong way on a freeway either. That's bad news too. And that's just about what this means on this flying up a canyon business. It's like the ridge crossing. If you don't know, you're already too late once you got in the canyon. Although the basic fundamental is in any canyon.